Welcome back to Cyberology, Dakota State's podcast for all things cyber and technology. I'm Jen Burris. I'm Lily Albers. And today we have a special guest with us, Dr. Mary Bell. Uh, she joined us this year as Dean of uh, the Beacom College of Computer and Cyber Sciences. Welcome, Mary. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you having me. And uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I grew up in Las Cruces, New Mexico, so from a state that has a lot of similarities to South Dakota, but maybe not in weather, <laughs> not the same weather. Uh, so I uh, was born there, grew up there, and a couple of things in my life that kind of impacted my development. One is we lived out in the country, and I grew up with horses competing from a very early age, so I think that's one thing that... Uh, had a big impact on kind of how I do things and how I see the world. And then through school, I was very involved in band. So that was another thing, music and discipline with the music and uh, marching band was drum major, the marching band. Oh, drum major, and, okay. Yeah, and we were like state champions. So, you know, really big, you know, big impacts mm -hmm. on my life, things like that. So that's a few things. Um, and then whenever I decided to go into... The university, so I went there in Las Cruces, where I grew up, Las Cruces, New Mexico, New Mexico State University. I went for a couple of years. My father and my stepmom actually lived in Germany, so I went and lived a, a couple of times, a couple of years with them in Germany. Went to a German gymnasium, oh, which is wow. a German That's high school. Cool. At the time, I had taken a couple of years of German when I was in high school, and that's another really formative event in my life was having that time in Germany. And I went to, like I said, a German high school, German gymnasium. And from there, I also played and went, uh, I played in a band there and we toured like in, in the high school. Mm -hmm. I played in a band and we did different concerts and kind of toured around and played. And so that was that was really fun and super interesting and a, a way to like apply that and do it in a different way than I had when I was growing up in New Mexico. So that was really awesome. So from there, whenever I went back to go to university, I, I, I went two years, moved to Germany, and then came back. I was the first time I had been around the military, so when I was in Germany. And mm -hmm. and based on that, my dad had said to me, you know, have you ever thought about joining the military? And frankly, I had not because I just had never been around it. So that's why that exposure in Germany when I was there around being around the military uh, had a really big impact on my life. So I ended up joining ROTC and commissioned out of ROTC into the Army. And so that was kind of like the start of my whole life, my whole career. And that's that's the background with you know, different leadership aspects from mm -hmm. horses to band to living in Germany and having that military exposure. Okay. And so um, did kind of that worldly experience inform your decision-making a little bit to see more of the world and kind of get out there and have these different experiences and leadership opportunities? Yeah, I, re I really think it did. I, I to this day, I, I'm not a person who has a lot of fancy things. I would much rather invest in experiences, and those experiences usually are through travel. And so I, I, I absolutely think if I hadn't had that time in Germany, I, mm -hmm. I don't know that I would have that same perspective on how important it is. To, to travel and see other cultures, experience them, and, and I just enjoy it so very much. So, yeah, I, I don't think I'd ever really thought about it, but, yes, it really did have a big impact. Okay. And so how did um, your journey in the military kind of impact your education along the way then? Whenever I graduated from, from ROTC then and graduated from Mexico State, I was commissioned into Army Aviation. And through that, I started flying. And it's interesting because my – degree of study in at New Mexico State was I have a, a Bachelor of Business Administration and International Business, so not a technical okay. background. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, it has a language associated with it, and my language was German, as you can imagine. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, from, from there, I didn't really have any like huge desire to just go and get more and more degrees, but... Uh, there's always education that's happening in different kinds of training and education as you're in the military. Mm -hmm. And as I got, you know, advanced more, I kind of realized that the advantages of getting the next level degree. So mm -hmm. I went back. I was a captain in the Army. I was stationed at Fort Hood, Texas, uh, which has since been renamed, and I can't name remember the name <laughs> off the top of my head. 
uh, in Central Texas, and I uh, went to St. Mary's University, which is out of San Antonio, and they had a satellite program there at Fort Hood and studied then international relations. When I did my undergraduate degree, I always loved all of my classes that had anything to do with international and did not like any of the classes really very much that had anything to do with business. And it turns out <laughs> there's this whole degree that I didn't even know existed <laughs> called international relations. Um, but I was one of those people that started my program of study and, you know, by golly, I was going to finish that <laughs> yeah. program. But I wasn't, I didn't ever change mm -hmm. uh, courses or anything. I just did started that. So that had a huge impact then because I really developed in that kind of that sense of different cultures and, and how other what other nations are doing impacts what happens in our nation uh, really just affected me. So that international relations master's degree was very helpful. And I will tell you when I finished it, I did it all. It was a Saturday program and it was, I think it was 40 or 42 Saturdays a year for two oh, years. Wow. So yeah. kind of for two years, you give up your whole life. Mm -hmm. And I just remember I was so done because that was just what I, I mean, it would be from like eight to five. I think I would go to school every Saturday from eight to five oh, wow. for, for two it's years. And working full time, mm -hmm. I was in a command position during that time. So very, very demanding job. And I mean, I was like, I am done. I will never <laughs> ever. Like, that's great. I like, I, I need to feel like I've accomplished it. That's I'm it. On. Yeah. That's it. I'd reached the pinnacle in my mind. I was good. Like, I really, and I was happy. And I really never in a million years would have dreamed that I would have gone back to school. But, you know, it was many, many, many years later that I... Uh, Enough I, distance to kind of forget about the pressure <laughs> I, of think that, I think that's exactly what it was. And uh, when I was a captain later, so this was like early captain or mid-captain when I was finishing my master's degree, because I had done my master's degree, if you will, on my own, in other words, the Army didn't send me for a year or two years to a program where I did just school, which happens. Mm -hmm. That's a very much something that can happen. But because I did it on my own, you don't have what's called a payback tour. So if you do it and the Army pays for it in this then example, you owe them. then you owe them something. Well, mm -hmm. I don't, didn't owe them anything because I had done it on my own time. Um, I did take what's called tuition assistance, but I did it on my own time. So this position came open at the Air Force Academy, which wasn't an Army position. I mean, it isn't for an Army officer, but it wasn't considered a payback tour. And I could take it because I had the master's degree, which was a requirement, mm -hmm. but I hadn't done it on the Army's time. So I was able to take this position. So that was my first time ever then working in federal academia. And I absolutely, I just, I loved it. It was such an incredible, great experience. So it really had a huge impact on my perspective of education and what it means. And so now I'm around a bunch of people who have, of course, doctorates. Some do, some don't there. You can teach there um, on a master's degree. And so that had a huge impact on kind of my perspective of Maybe I would consider, but I, was still, I wasn't even close to being ready at that point, but at least I was around it and understood what it could do for you and what diff different kinds of doors that it could open for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then um, what helped you kind of take that next step then to get your doctorate? So I looked into it a couple of times then in later years, and I just thought, you know, hey, if I start my doctorate now... In, you know, even if I kind of take the slow road, which is maybe six or eight years to do it, mm -hmm. six or eight years is going to pass, and I either could have some of this achieved or not. But then I was just had so much work that I was doing, and I, I was deployed a lot, and it really just made it tough. So I looked into it, but I was like, it just wasn't possible because I was deployed so much. And then my uh, last tour in the Army, I didn't know it was going to be my last tour in the Army, but I got stationed at the National Defense University. And while I was teaching there, I was still on active duty. I was a lieutenant colonel at the time. And you could teach again on a master's degree. Uh, that was allowed. But I started to think about what am I going to do after and do I want to still be in the military? And I really decided that there was a different way to serve. And so I decided that I, I would like to, to stay in academia, but not do so as a civilian. I was ready mm -hmm. to, to leave the military. I had a young child. So I had a, a son who was two years old, and it was getting harder and harder. And I got orders to go to Korea, which would have been 
uh, virtually impossible. I think I would have had to, you know, like give them up to a family member. Oh, wow. And I just was like, you know, I've served, I've done my time, and I had enough time to, to retire. Mm -hmm. So I decided to retire. And then I was I was still kind of on the fence, like, what am I going to do? And I thought in, a, in a, a good in-between step is I could go to school for a couple of years because I had what's called the GI Bill, that mm -hmm. the military, then based on your service, you get this paid for. And I thought it'll give me a few years to kind of like figure out who I am and what I'm going to do in my next yeah. version of mm -hmm. my life. And it seems like now so incredibly crazy that you think of this would be a good way to do that because it was hard uh, to do. Um, a, a single mom, you know, had to hire a nanny because my program that I went into for my doctorate was a night program. So I hired a oh. nanny that would come. Mm -hmm. And the other interesting thing is, is that the program offered classes four nights a week. But because of my son, I, I would only be away from him from two nights a week. So instead of kind of like designing a program and taking the classes to get to that program, I just said, whatever classes are on this night and whatever classes that are on that night, that's Those what I'm going to study. <laughs> yeah. And we'll figure out how to you know put it together mm -hmm. into this puzzle. And it did. It worked out. Um, it wasn't the way I thought it was going to go. <laughs> so I ended up in kind of like a different area of study than originally I thought I would be. Uh, but you know, I think that all things happen the way they're supposed to, and and it worked out really well for me. But it it, it was it's hard uh, mm -hmm. getting your doctorate is not for oh, the faint of heart. <laughs> I will can say. only imagine. I know. I regularly we talk to people who have done it, and you know, if everything if I knew everything that I knew now and would go back in that time, mm -hmm. um, like. Like, no, I would not go through that <laughs> I would not do it again. <laughs> no, I'm thankful. I don't mean to say I'm, I'm very, very thankful because it's it obviously completely changes your perspective and your life and how I wouldn't be here if I hadn't done that. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm thankful I did it. But if I knew everything I knew, I probably would not have done it. So it's good I had a little bit of ignorance in there. Uh, we all need it just to have to <laughs> that's, right, that's right. That's right. Nobody would have children. Nobody. <laughs> exactly. Nobody would have like you said, over time, <laughs> you, you, you fades a little bit. You're like, I could do that. I could do that again. Uh, so um, you mentioned earlier aviation. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was uh, like getting into aviation um, since that wasn't maybe a natural interest of yours right away, if I'm understanding correctly? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I, uh, a lot of people who go into aviation have thought that there's something they would want to do from the very young age. I wasn't that way. Uh, I didn't even really think about it as a possibility until I was in ROTC. And there were several of my fellow cadets who were very interested in it. And one of our military professors was an aviator. So he was a major, he was in aviation. And so he just kind of, you know, explained things and, it, and it's hard. Like there's a lot of like wickets you have to go through because there's a lot of physical things you have to do as far as, um, you know, different eye exams. It's like a different level of like no kidding, making sure that you're physically fit. But then also just it's extremely competitive for grades and different activities. And so you really have to want it to be able to get into Army aviation. And I don't know what, what it is like today, but at the time... To be able to go into aviation, it had to be your number one choice. You could not say, well, I think I want to go into aviation. I'm going to put it as my number two choice. That wasn't allowed. If you wanted it, it had to be your number one choice. So you really, really had to want it, and you had to be very determined to get it. And I, I don't think I would have had that had I not had these fellow cadets who were going along that path, and I could just kind of tag along. When they went and did this thing, I did it. When they did this other thing, I would go do it. And when they did this mm -hmm. thing, I'm like, that sounds good. I'll try that too. But I... Because I grew up really as an outdoorsy person out in the country with horses, the idea, like it really, it resonated with me that mm -hmm. it was, I could do something like that was really meant a lot that was helping the nation, helping um, you know my family, everything, but I could do it and still be outside and do outdoorsy types of things that really uh, resonated with me. And so that was, that was what kind of took me down that path. Also, my grandfather was a pilot. Um, my step, uh, my, my father um, had his pilot license as well, but my grandfather flew for the forestry service in New Mexico, and was kind of a uh, known for it. It was a it was a big deal. He designed some different things, and so that was also something that um, I kind of had a connection with my grandfather on that. Mm -hmm. But even then, it wasn't until if it wasn't for these fellow cadets, I frankly I would have never done it. So those are the people in this case that really kind of changed the trajectory of what I wanted to do. Very cool. Um, so how did, 
um, your role in military positions kind of inform your uh, leadership and um, uh, your teaching over the years? Yeah, so so I flew several different platforms, and I say this because it, it kind of matters and how those different platforms and how you lead is different. So the first thing that I flew, well, when I was in flight school, I flew what's called the UH-1, the Huey, um, but then I transitioned uh, out of flight school into the UH-60 Blackhawk. And I say that because the Blackhawk is used, it's a very tactical purpose. So when you're flying Blackhawks, you're flying people around, it's, uh, you know, kind of the age-old mindset when you see, you know, people like, hey, go take that hill. Like, you just do it. You don't stop and ask questions. Why would we want to take that hill? And so that's kind of what we mean by tactical. You just, like, there's a mission. You do it. Um, you accomplish it. And because it's vital to the to the next level that whoever is here at this is, is doing that type of mission. So I say that because the leadership style is very different. And I learned this because later on I transitioned into fixed-wing aviation and to military intelligence. And that type of mission is very, very different. It's a, there's a lot of thinking involved. It's, it's a lot of like strategic impacts on what this intelligence is being used for. And when I transitioned out of the tactical, which is very much, hey, go do this, go do that. It's, a, it's again, kind of like in and out, done, it done, is. done. And the leadership in that is very, it's frankly, it's very directive. Not that they weren't super smart people like that we would work with, but we were just, it was more like, go do this, Yes, ma'am, you know, kind mm -hmm. of a, whereas in military um, intelligence, it is not that way. And so I, I, I had- More of a drawn out process and thinking and considering aspects and stuff it, like that. Is it that is. And the leadership is different instead of saying, hey, go do that. Like these are, it's just a different, it's not that the, they're any smarter. It's just a different type of environment. But I will tell you, a lot of my enlisted people did have master's degrees as an example. So there's a, a lot more education. And so saying, hey, we're going to go do this. Like we really would need to talk about it. And I would need to explain to them like why we were going to maybe change this process or change it rather than just say, just, just do it, <laughs> <laughs> which is what I had come from. And so I, you know, probably, you know, had some stumbles along the way as I transitioned my leadership styles. But I say that because you develop, and I think that's natural, even if like any organization you go into, if you start in at the lower level, you know, how you develop and then as you raise up, of course, your leadership styles are going to change in that as well. So I don't know that it's just because it was tactical to, you know, the type of thing. I just think it's natural that the higher you get up, the more people around you who are also higher. And it's just a different way of communicating. Um, so that first level, you know, I, I, I definitely had to do some transitioning. And I say that because then in the educational environment, it's, it's a very different. So there's training, right? And that's the, hey, I can take my my weapon apart and I can put it back together. That's training. That's not education. I'm not educating you on how to take your weapon apart. I'm training you how to take your weapon apart. But then there's parts of it that's education. And, you know, in what we're doing, it's all education. And so uh, there might be some aspects a little bit here or there where you're training to, I don't know, pull the switch out and pull mm -hmm. that, put that switch in there, sure. But really, it's the education of the impact of what's going to happen when you do that. The and consequence. The consequence and the impact and how do you think about it on a broader scale. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, over the years in the military, as that leadership style developed, it really helped me as I transitioned into education because it is more that that kind of strategic level thinking and thinking about impacts and how does this connect to that and what's going to happen if you do that, if you do that over here, what's what's the impact going to be? Mm -hmm. Okay. And that kind of leads into my next question, which is um, why is intelligence important um, and how does it impact industries outside of the government? Because it's not solely, I mean, that's largely what we think of when we think intelligence, but how does it kind of branch rock? out? Yeah, thank you. Whether you realize it or not, you know, intelligence is part of everything we do. So we do try to distinguish the difference between information and intelligence. And intelligence information is can just be data sets, but the intelligence is what does that data set have to do with what I'm trying to do? And so even if it's a decision about you know hey, am I going to get out on those roads today to go drive to the grocery store? 
there's a level of intelligence involved in that. So when you think about intelligence in the government, I think it's natural. A lot of people think about that, but it's very true also in industry. It's no different, and maybe sometimes it might be called something different, and the processes might not be labeled intelligence processes because we do associate that term specifically with certain, especially with defense. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's really involved in anything they do, whether it's collecting information on a competitor. And I mean, that's intelligence, right? Mm -hmm. it, it is. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's part of really everything. And our it's part of our lives in every step of the way. It's just a matter of how we think about it. But if you really start to think about it and kind of break it down, you'll, you'll like realize, oh, I could see how that would be considered intelligence. So mm -hmm. if it's something, it's a data set, but then you think about what does it mean? What's the impact? That's intelligence. Implication. Implication. How, how does it uh, relate to everything else That's going right. On? That's right. So it's it's really a part of everything we do, frankly. There's very, I, I can't even think of any business that could survive if they didn't have some type of process. I'm sure they'll call it something else that has, that's doing that type mm -hmm. of analysis and what does it mean and what's the impact. Okay. And so what kind of, um, have you enjoyed about this transition from uh, the military into education and what's kind of kept you on that journey? So when I was a lot younger and I was flying, still flying Blackhawks, we would do, one of the things we would do is static displays. So at air shows, they would, you'd go and you'd fly in and you'd stand by your Blackhawk, you know, during mm -hmm. the day and people come and go. And a lot of times, it, it can certainly be adults, but a lot of times it can be kids. And it's just, you know, they would ask questions and I, to me, that was always really fun to be able to share some of it, some experiences and talk about whether it's just the helicopter in general or maybe talk about some different missions. And I think people really enjoy that. It's something different than what they're used to doing. And so there's something really enjoyable about hearing about these kind of experiences that they're just not used to. So there's 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 part of that. And then um, when I was I was stationed in El Paso, Texas, in the 204th Military Intelligence Battalion, uh, they asked me for an elementary school if I would be a judge for a spelling bee. <laughs> so that was super fun. <laughs> I mean, I say this because it's all in a way it's all related because it's mm -hmm. part of this education. And um, whenever you think about you know that that education and what it means, and whenever you see people kind of light up, mm -hmm. um, and like that light, it's it's inspiring. And so, you know, when you can inspire somebody else to become something or dream of becoming something that maybe they didn't realize was possible, it's, it's inspiring to them, but it's also inspiring to the person who's doing that. So it's like mm -hmm. this feedback you, loop. You get, yeah, the it, positive reinforcement for both. It really, it really does. Um, one of the, another super incredibly informative experience for me was I was uh, in Haiti for, it's called Operation Uphold Democracy, and we were there. I was there for three months flying around, and everywhere we would land, there would be so many people just absolutely fascinated. And if we were on the ground for two hours or four hours or six hours, there would be hundreds of people that would just come and just stand and just like watch because they've never seen anything like this. And, you know, there'd be a lot of times the kids, of course, are a little more bold. And so they would come up and maybe try to <laughs> talk questions. to you or they didn't speak the same speak language. language but, okay. um, but there was a, a, there was one time, especially there was a, a little girl and she came up and she just she just held my hand. And, oh. you know, when you think about what education means and what it means to inspire somebody, uh, you know, I just those kinds of moments like that just mean absolutely everything. Yeah, just the mere presence. It is. It is. And then my my job before I, I came here, I was teaching in a program called the Joint Events Warfighting School, uh, which is a senior service college for the military. And my students are uh, very advanced. They're, uh, they've been in the military anywhere from like 15 to 25 years. Wow. And just absolutely the best of the best. And I, I loved being in the room with them. And again, I, you know, I got as much inspiration from them or more perhaps than I gave them. But again, I think it's that's one of the biggest things about education is you you give, but I find that no how matter much you give, you always get more back if you're doing it well and if you're doing it right. And I think to me that's why, you know, that's so incredibly important in that connection. 
those relationships that you form and build and it, it, get to enjoy. It really is. And the nice thing with the, with the adults, whenever you know I'm in the mm-hmm. adult education, is I get to see them. A lot of them, I still have um, contact with a lot of my former students, whether it was from the Air Force Academy, who are now retiring, which is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm watching them, some of them like now retiring. Like I don't know how that's possible. You're um, still you're still a young age. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, and then other ones, you know, getting promoted to general or admiral, and just seeing the amazing things they're doing, and whether or not you know, really, you know, maybe I had the tiniest small piece of that, but um, you know, I love that, and I love I I do stay in contact with a lot of my former students, and they're just absolutely wonderful oh, people, nice. and. Um, I love that it's just, it, so it never ends. This guess is what I'm saying. That that feedback and you know they inspire me way more than I ever inspired them. It must be cool to see them kind of advance throughout the years too and develop their own careers. And- it's the best. It is such an incredible feeling, and I don't I don't like I don't want to say I take pride in it. Like I had a piece of it. It's more just the joy of knowing a little bit about that person, a little bit about their life, and then seeing the amazing things that they're accomplishing. Um, just, you know, to kind of be able to be a t- a touch a, a small part of that, a witness of it is really, really awesome. Yeah. Amazing. So uh, what kind of drew you to DSU? What made DSU the right fit for you on this next journey in yeah. your career? So t- two questions. I'll, I'll start with the what drew you to DSU mm-hmm. question. Uh, and as I was kind of searching, I, I felt like I had kind of reached the, the pinnacle of where I was, mm-hmm. of where I, what I could grow to where at where I was. And so it was time for me to start looking. And based on my, my I have a son and based on his age and school, trying to figure out when would be a time to move and mm-hmm. when would be a, a bad time to move, uh, I, had, I started looking, I guess, I guess about a year ago is when I started looking. And really just as I looked at the programs and the connections with government, so they have, you know, this, these incredible technologically advanced programs, uh, the connections, because through military intelligence, I had a lot of connections with both the National Security Agency and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Um, we don't have a connection here at DSU with uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, but we do with the National Security Agency. Mm-hmm. And I, I just, I could see those lines and how, you know, the possibility of what I had could could come here and and be something that would be useful. Mm-hmm. Really, for me, I felt like I had so much more to give. And I think that's what it came down to me. It wasn't just that, you know, I, I loved what I did. I loved what I taught. I think I could have, frankly, I could have stayed there forever. But I did feel like I just had more to give and I mm-hmm. had room to grow. And so I was looking for a place where maybe I could grow a little bit more in that. And that's where I, you know, the, the the programs here and those connections is what really drew me to DSU. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I applied, and I'm super thankful for the team who, you know, saw that connection in me and and asked me to come here. Uh, what I would say is that uh, that I that I love about it and what made me decide, yes, absolutely, it's worth the move. It's worth mm-hmm. all of that goes with it. <laughs> all um, the snow, all the snow. All the snow. <laughs> I've, I've I'd only been to South Dakota once ever in my life before, and I was at Ellsworth Air Force Base for a mission. When I oh was, wow, <laughs> yeah. So I was, it was with. Um, we, I flew uh, as part of a treaty. This is a little bit of a tangent. I p- flew part of a treaty um, called the Open Skies Treaty and, and flew with the Russians. So I spent three years in and out of Russia and the Russians three years in and out of here. And whenever the Russians were on their plane flying here, um, then there's certain – their designated Open Skies bases. It, the, oh, okay. the treaty is um, not – it's not uh, being used anymore. But Ellsworth is one of the Open Skies Air Force bases. Mm-hmm. So um, – I was there actually with the suites, so we had come, um, and so that was the only time. But I was there like two days. We flew in and we flew out. So I don't, you know, I think we were what in a vehicle. Time of year? I feel like it was spring, so it was no, it wasn't the full experience. <laughs> no, it was not. I remember having like I remember wearing a jacket, but there I don't think there was any snow. I, have, I in fact I just came across the picture of us the whole group standing in front of Mount Rushmore. Uh, so it, it was a it, it was very mild for sure. Um, it w- was those connections? But then when I came here, um, I I got to talk to a lot of the people, and I will tell you, it's just I, I'm just so incredibly impressed with the people. And and after I accepted the job and moved here, it's even more impressive than I thought originally. I think that as part of the Department of Defense, we we think we kind of have a 
uh, the most people who are just like super passionate about uh, defense and it, it's you know, it's really not about the money because you're not in defense if it's anything to do with the money. Uh, and so you just kind of have these impressions of academia and you, you hear a lot of, of bad stories about, you know, people trying to crawl over other people to, mm -hmm. to hold them down so that they can advance. And there's absolutely none of that here. Um, it's just such an incredibly great environment. And from, you know, the president down to like the, the cleaning staff to like you name it, I just find that everybody is kind and seems happy, um, which I don't think is true in a lot of places, but just the incredible, exceptional amount of talent here. Uh, I, I never am ceased to be amazed at how much talent and how much passion and how much people here really, really care about education. And it just shows in everything we're doing. And as DSU is growing, and I see that um, these programs exploding in the good way, uh, yeah. <laughs> just, just absolutely growing and growing. And it's so exciting when that's not happening in a lot of other places. Mm -hmm. um, and I just think that, you know, the environment here is just... It's absolutely amazing what is has been created and how everybody works together and really just cares so much about student education. And so what are you looking forward to most um, in this new position? I, still, I think it just always comes back to the people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the most exciting thing here is that the possibilities really feel endless. There's, it's, it's if you have an idea, uh, you know, figure out how to resource it or, you know, go to the leadership, get resource for it. It's like that, you know, great, go run with that. And it just feels like, you know, in, and I don't want it to sound bad because I loved my time in defense, but there's so much regulation and, you know, it's very specific what mm -hmm. we're doing. And that's a good thing because when you know what you're doing, you know, you can also educate in a very specific way because you know what the intention is here. Um, but here it's like the possibilities are so endless as I think about things where, adding the master's degree in artificial mm -hmm. intelligence. I know you just talked to Dr. O'Brien about that. Yeah. And just, you know, that's exciting. The things that are happening, um, quantum, as we think about mm -hmm. quantum computing, it's so incredibly exciting and things that are in the future and we're in that space and we're living in that space and we're owning that space and we're just expanding into that space. It's so exciting. And I love being a part of a place that has such a, uh, attitude, uh, entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. and innovation. Forward thinking. So forward thinking. It's really fun. It's just every day is fun and exciting. There's always something new on it. It oh, is. Yeah. I love it. I love it. People have ideas. I'm like, ah, that's another great idea. <laughs> let's do it. Write that down. Somebody else comes to me, you know, today, like, what about this? I'm like, absolutely. Think about it. Let's do that. Or or if I have an idea and I take it to the leadership, like, great idea. Let's, let's figure out how to get that mm -hmm. done. And I just, it really feels just absolutely limitless. Mm -hmm. That's super exciting. Yeah. There's also, I think, a good collaborative vibe on campus as well. So collaborative. And that's, you know, I guess I didn't say it because I talked about passion and, and that desire for student education and working together on ways to to improve that from, you know, I just, the, the Governor Cyber Academy, what is happening there is so insanely exciting and expanding into, you know, the the, the, the high schools mm -hmm. all throughout the state uh, that is growing just leaps and bounds. It's exceeded, you know, the president's and uh, the dean's expectations on what was going to happen there. And just across the space, like you name it, from to the to cyber her, to the middle, the middle school girls, to what's happening in the high schools. I, it's just so exciting. And the collaboration across the, all the colleges, mm -hmm. we, you know, we're, we're looking at adding more and more degrees where we're cross college um, collaboration. Mm -hmm. And that there's, interdisciplinary. It is. It's so, I just, it's super exciting. And I love the team that fellow deans that I get to work with and the provost and Fred, it's just, it's so much fun seeing things just growing and growing and growing. I think really our, our only limit, frankly, is time. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there's only really, truly, um, at least so far, there's still only 24 hours in a day. And, you know, that's one of our biggest limitations is time. Someday we'll figure it out, right? <laughs> I know. I think so. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen right here at DSU. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Okay, well, I've been hogging all the questions. Do you have anything? I've kind of been taking my questions. Well, I've, been so I've, involved, I've had but... some of the same questions, and now I can't think of any, like, new ones. Well, if you, uh, if people needed to know one thing about you, what, the, what should they know? 
Oh my goodness gracious. That sounds like an icebreaker. Like, tell me oh, yeah, a fun fact a about yourself. <laughs> One thing about me. Oh, I don't know. We'll start next episode with that. that we should. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Even no, that's that might be worse because to start that <laughs> way. Right? Although maybe if you'd asked the question at the beginning by the end, maybe I'd have an answer. <laughs> I don't know. Uh I care. I uh I I work I work really, really hard and I'm willing to do that work. Um gladly. Like without even a second thought, um, uh, because I really do I really do care about, I'm, that's why I'm here. I'm here for student get education. Um, it, it, we do a lot of things around that, but ultimately it all comes back to that is mm -hmm. how do we, one, just make sure that we're always improving the student education, uh, improving the number of students that we're educating. I mean, so that's really what it comes down to. And so I'm willing, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm hardworking. I'm, I, 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 I'm not saying I'm, I'm dumb by any means, but, you know, whenever I stand in a meeting or I'm in a meeting with all of the faculty at Beacom, uh, I am not the smartest person in that room. Um, I don't pretend to be the smartest person in the room, but I am hardworking and I hope that, you know, I can provide some good leadership skills. So I don't know. I don't, that's not really a good answer, though. I'm going to like the 30 minutes from now, I'm going to come up with this great answer. <laughs> like, what's we'll the get, one thing you should know about me? <laughs> we'll get an email and like have I, that's This is what I should have said. This is what I should have said. I know. I don't know. I love my family. We'll, we'll just stick a, a text copy in the edited <laughs> video. <laughs> this like, is what she yeah, really meant to say. Yeah, her voiceover at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she came back later and said, you know, no, I, I think with the military um, background, I, different groups becomes your family. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just, I'm really happy to be part of this DSU family. And I don't know, I, I'd be curious to see what somebody else would answer that question about me. Like, well, if you were to say one thing about her, what would you say? I, I really what don't know. What would you pick out? I know. I feel like that's a hard out. question <laughs> for is. anybody. Yeah. Even if it's not about yourself. It's right. Like if I had to pick one thing to say about my best friend, I don't know what I would say. Right. It is. That's tough. It is a tough one. <laughs> okay. Well, if you um, had to say... Um, oh boy, here comes another hard question. I know. Something... Um, give us your Beacom College pitch. Why should people check out the, oh, the Beacom oh, College of Computer yeah. and Cyber Sciences? Okay. If they haven't already. Yeah, yeah. So I have had the opportunity to to kind of do this pitch of a fair amount. And Ooh, perfect. I She's know. prepared, prepped, <laughs> ready to go. I know. So it depends a little bit on the environment as to mm -hmm. you know how I start and what I say. But uh, you know, I just really talk about uh, the amazing programs. Mm -hmm. I always will come back to one of the most important things you need to know is that we hold all three of the NSA. It's the Cybersecurity Center of Academic Excellence mm -hmm. designation, CAEs, right? So that's a huge one. There's only 10 universities in the entire nation that hold those. All three designations mm -hmm. were one of 10, which is puts us one of the top 10 nations in the world in this space. So cybersecurity and, and artificial intelligence, that's exciting. When I think about students, this, this is one of the things that I think is really important for people to understand is... Whenever you take the incoming students as a freshman class here at DSU, I would argue, and not to put in any way impugn any group of people, it's not any different than a group of students starting at any other university. Mm -hmm. It's a cross section. There's different people. Some are stronger academically than others. You have, you know, some who are more athletically inclined. Some who are more introverts. That kind of that cross section isn't any different. What I can see is that what happens for, let's just say for the undergraduate, for the four years they're here uh, ish, the four years ish mm -hmm. that they're here, what then you get as a graduate out of DSU is dramatically different than what you're getting at other universities. Like the graduate here is something that has been just, I think it's what the faculty pour into them. Mm -hmm. uh, that they come out very, very different. And and we have 100% employment, right? So every graduate out of DSU gets a job, and not just in Beacom, gets a job within their field, and we're at 99.7%. So when we say 100, we really mean that. The, the demand for DSU graduates is so high. 
different companies are come to me all the time, contacting me like, how do we get DSU grads? Mm-hmm. I'm like, well, you and everybody else wants a DSU grad. <laughs> so I think that's there's there's something so incredibly special about that process of the educational process here. Mm-hmm. Again, I don't think we start with a different level of student body. We start with that same kind of cross section, but it's that molding, that faculty pouring into them mm-hmm. that makes us a super special place. We're in the process of doing a lot of interviews. We're hiring new faculty. Mm -hmm. And what I hear repeatedly as the faculty come to campus, they're like, the energy here is different. It's so positive. Whether you're walking across campus and, you know, um, Rose O'Brien is taking them on a tour and (laughs) she's high-fiving people and, you know, talking to people and it... And you don't see that type of energy in a lot of other places where, where we really are kind of one big family. Mm-hmm. And I think there, it, there's something incredibly special about what happens here. And then I go to like the U.S. cyber team and I think about the fact that there's uh, 30 students on the U.S. cyber team, ages 15 to 25. And when you look at the number of DSU students who are on the U.S. cyber team, so there's four from DSU. Mm-hmm. The next highest university to have only has has two students. So there's not a there's some several this universities is the with second one. Second year that we've had four, I believe. It's for sure. It's the second year, and, and the I, fir- the year before, I think it was three. And that and so and, and, and this is the third year. Third year. Okay. So, so yeah, I think every year we've had three or. four more okay um representing yeah. on the DSU on the team which is just it is fabulous it's absolutely i mean and we're this relatively small school mm-hmm. and yet to that have and at this i mean we're talking olympic level right for cyber games and to have, for us this small school to have four students on that team just again i you can, i just don't think you can speak enough and it I, it's what happens here while they're here, the development, the possibilities, the hands-on learning. We don't just do theory. We teach them how to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a really exciting place. And I, I, I credit the faculty, the leadership, but it's the whole environment. Without without the administration, um, without the admissions department, the registrar, like they all are just infuse just joy and, and people are kind. And it's, it's a really special place. This is a really, really special place. Okay. Well... Um, we we want to let you go okay. in time uh, to get to your next appointment. But uh, if anybody has any questions for you or wants to reach out, how how should they go about contacting you? Um, Dangerous question. <laughs> I know. I know. So you, just the website, right? So if yep. you go to dsu.edu, mm-hmm. um, you can. I'm, I'm right there. Um, my phone number and my email address. So I actually really, I don't want to say it because I'd rather them go to the website because when they go to yeah, the website, right? they they're going to see all the amazing other things on Super there. cool things that are happening. You are our first uh, student who just got is uh, got his SFSC, which is Space Force Specialty Code. No, like, yes, SFSC. Um, going to the Space Force and mm-hmm. going to be a space operator. Like, that's exciting. That's on the, yeah. the front page <laughs> of the website, you know, things like that. Uh, so, yeah, dsu.edu. Go there. Check it out. You can find me. You can find my email. You can find my address and get a hold of me that way. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. And thank you for watching or listening. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe.